Welcome, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today for this session of the AgriAbility webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about vision and how to maximize vision with a variety of different technologies and techniques. Our presenters today will be a variety of staff members from the uh, Goodwill of the Finger Lakes uh, in uh, Rochester, New York. And they will be joining us in just a minute after I give you a few basic webinar instructions. As you hopefully know, uh, audio is available, available both through your phone or computer. You may use the communicate menu up in the top left of your screen in order to check your audio or make adjustments there. If you need closed captioning, please go to the multimedia viewer. It's on the bottom right of your screen. You'll need to expand that section, and that will contract some of the other sections, so you may not be able to see, for example, the uh, number of attendees. But go to the multimedia viewer, and you will probably need to enter your name and organization in order to access that, but you should be able to see the captions uh, after that point. You can expand or contract any of those options on the right panel of your screen by clicking on the arrow. And you can also drag in between the presenter area and the right column to either uh, increase or decrease the size of those columns. One other thing we ask, if you um, have more than one person that is viewing at your particular site, we would ask that you would enter that information into the chat area. That's also one of the options on the right side to let us know so that we can keep track of the approximate number of people that attended today. We do welcome your questions and comments. At any time during the presentation, you may enter those into the chat area. We would ask that you select all panelists as the option for sending that so that we don't miss any of your questions during the question and answer period. You need to make sure that the chat option is activated. You can see uh, the chat icon at the top. If it's not blue, then you need to click on that to activate it. Make sure you hit the send button in order to uh, get your comments to us. Also, during our question and answer period, if you would like to ask, ask a question verbally, you may do so by clicking on the raise hand icon that you should see near your name. By the way, we do have many people on the uh, event today. You may only see your own name, but there are many others that are participating today, just to let you know. We will do your be our best to enable your microphone or phone connection if you would like to ask a question verbally. Before we get to the question and answer period and after the actual presentation, we will have four quick poll questions to get your feedback. We'd appreciate you sharing during that time. We are recording this session. It will be archived along with approximately 60 others that have been presented on the agribility.org website on the online training link. So please feel free to check that out. A variety of other helpful webinars are available there. If you have any issues with technical problems, uh, please uh, let us know through the chat option. And if for some reason you're not able to do that, you can email me, jonesp at purdue.edu. For those of you who may not be familiar with AgriBility, we are sponsored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and our focus is on assisting agricultural workers that have some kind of disability or functional limitation. Every one of the AgriAbility projects is a partnership between the Land Grant University in the state and at least one nonprofit disability services organization. There are currently 20 AgriAbility projects around the country. There's one national AgriAbility project, and that is led um, by Purdue's Breaking New Round Resource Center. Our partners on the uh, National AgriAbility Project include Goodfil Goodwill of the Finger Lakes, uh, our presenters today, 
April, which is the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living and Colorado State University. If you'd like more information about AgriBility, uh, including a variety of resources, again, feel free to uh, go to agribility.org and uh, check out that information. This time, I'm going to pass things over to Joe Beth Rath, who is uh, one of our staff members on, on the AgriBility project at Goodwill of the Finger Lakes. And I will pass her the ball and she can begin the main presentation. Thank you, Paul. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm here with a team from um, Goodwill of the Finger Lakes. We are a group that has several different responsibilities, and you're going to meet a few of our team members today. Um, so just a little bit of background about ABVI. We are a program of Goodwill of the Finger Lakes. So ABVI is the Association of the Blind and Visually Impaired. We are located in Rochester, New York, which is in upstate New York, and we serve a nine-county region in the New York State for ABVI services. Um, we provide comprehensive vision rehabilitation services at ADVI, and our mission is to prepare and empower people who are blind or visually impaired to be self-sufficient and contribute to their families and communities. So we talk about vision rehabilitation, and sometimes people don't know what that means. It isn't really about getting vision back. It's really about how to adapt everyday activities to the vision that you have. So on our team, we have vision rehabilitation therapists, and their job is really to look at activities that you want to do in this every day and to figure out how to perform those with the vision that you do have, or if you don't have vision, how to use tools that will help you. We have orientation and mobility specialists. Their role is to teach individuals how to travel safely using tools and techniques that will keep them safe in any environment. And then we have career development specialists who help individuals obtain or maintain employment using individualized career services and technology training and adapting things to their vision. So from our team today, you're gonna to meet Nikki Llewellyn and Janie Baker, both who are certified as orientation and mobility specialists. James Hallahan, who's our assistive technology instructor in-house and also one of the people that works to get, ensure that people have skills to maintain and gain employment. And Joette Behe, who's a career development specialist who helps people with the skills needed to find a job. So one of the first things we want to focus on um, it's important in the field that we work in is that we protect what we've got. So according to Prevent Blindness America, 90% of eye injuries are preventable if we had selected the appropriate protection um, from sun, particles that are flying, sparks, and chemicals. So as you're out working with clients in the field, just making sure that they have protective eyewear for the things that they're doing will help them maintain the vision they have, reduce accidents, and reduce uh, wear and tear on their eyes. So we first want to think about that. Um, I want to turn things over to Nikki Llewellyn, who's going to talk about what the aspects of vision that we talk about when we look at vision rehabilitation. And Nikki will walk through those with us, and then we'll start talking about the things that we do to help people maximize that. So I'm going to turn that over to Nikki Llewellyn. Great. Welcome. Um, I want to talk about aspects of vision. And vision is not clarity alone. There's acuity, visual field, and contrast sensitivity. So acuity is what you probably most often think of when it comes to vision loss. Um, acuity is a, me a measurement of clarity, and it's usually measured in 20-foot increments, sometimes 10-foot increments if the person really can't even see 20 feet away. So 20-20 vision is just kind of what they call normal vision. So 2200 vision would be what most people can see at 20 feet appears to the person with 2200 vision as if it were 200 feet away. So that's the, the focus, the clarity, the blurriness. Another aspect of vision is visual field. And that's how big of a viewing area you have. A straight line is 180 degrees. Usually our visual field is about 170 degrees. So a good full 
visual field. However, the peripheral field, if you have peripheral field loss, it's like you have tunnel vision. It's like looking through straws. And sometimes the little pinpoints of vision get so small that the brain is seeing two different pictures. And then the brain has the choice of doing one of two things. It can kind of fill in what they think is in the middle, which isn't always helpful because your brain might not think of the post that actually is in the middle. Or your brain can disregard one of the pictures and then you no longer have a binocular vision, so you have poor depth perception. This kind of presents as someone who perhaps over or under reaches, bumps on their sides, or over or under steps. A central field loss that's like macular degeneration, wherever the person's gaze is fixed, that's where the blind spot is and they cannot see around it. Um, so the person may be looking off to the side. You may think, why aren't they looking at me? Well, to see you, they're trying to catch you in their peripheral vision. And the peripheral vision is never 20-20. It is at best 20 over 60. So it's always a little blurry. Uh, the last one or last aspect, is contrast sensitivity. And contrast refers to how well the object or viewing target stands out from the background. So white on black is great contrast, and you can see it on the screen. Um, gray on black or gray on white, not so good contrast. Contrast sensitivity presents as someone who might not be able to tell which light on the traffic light is really lit. Or maybe the flame is on the stove, but they don't really um, kind of see it because it's not a high contrast. And we're going to talk about some ways to enhance your vision, some tips and techniques to use a little further along the line. Right now, I'm going to introduce Janie Baker, who is a certified orientation and mobility specialist here at API. She's going to talk to you a little bit about mobility. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I provide orientation and mobility training here at ABPI. And um, just to give you a little idea what that is, it's we teach safe and independent and efficient travel skills. Um, helping you use your remaining vision, traveling with a long cane or a guide dog, and we teach um, scanning techniques and strategies, and also how to use transportation and find transportation in your area. Um, orientation is knowing where you are in relation to other people, places, or, or things, and also relationship between two locations. And mobility refers to how an individual is going to move through the environment. And then various tools are used to help uh, you move safely and, in, and um, efficiently. And some of those are pictured on this slide. Um, there is a support cane that is taped with white and red reflective tape. And that is a weight-bearing device. Uh, and with the white and red reflective tape, that resembles a white cane, so it can help others know that uh, that the user is visually impaired, legally blind. Um, there's also in the center picture, we have a variety of different white canes and ID canes. White cane is also known as a long cane. And then you'll see various tips um, on those canes. And then there's the guide dog in the middle. And um, I'm going to just show um, some of our tips so that you can see them a little closer up. These are all tips from Ambutech. And this first one here, this, this is a jumbo roller tip. And it's good for um, using right on the ground or surface. You can, it's called constant contact technique when used on a cane. And it's good for rough surfaces. Uh, it's good in grass. Uh, on dirt, snow, um, we have a couple other tips similar like that. This is the uh, rolling ball tip, 
and it is also good for snow, grass, rough surfaces. You can also use it on uh, smooth surfaces as well in constant contact technique. Um, it's one of the heavier tips, but uh, we find a lot of people really like that for outdoor use. There's also, um, this is the uh, marshmallow, uh, rolling marshmallow tip. And uh, this also, this is probably one of the most popular because it's, it's somewhat small, but um, it can also be used constant contact, two-point touch, which would be just lifting the cane between both ends of the arc. So you'd be tapping from left to right um, with it. And um, so also indoor and outdoor tip. The uh, pencil tip, this is the lightest tip, and it tends to get more snagged um, as you travel. So rougher surfaces, it wouldn't be as good, but for a smooth surface indoors or smooth surface outdoors, um, it can still be a nice tip. You can also tap it. That's mostly what it would be useful for is tapping um, in the, um, on both ends of the arc. Then we have, um, this is a rover free wheel. Um, and uh, this is used for constant contact technique as well on a rough surface. It's very light rubber. Um, and, and this is a slide uh, of the tips, many of which we just went over. Two of them that I did hold up, um, the one in the center is the Dakota desk. And that is really great for uh, travel on snow. You wouldn't want to use that uh, in, on any rough surface like cement or asphalt because it is hollow and it's very soft rubber, but it works great on snow or grass. Uh, the Bundu Basher on the far right, that is available through Bevria.com. That is an Australia-based company, but it does work on an Ambutech cane. Uh, which is uh, very common. Those are the canes that we have here at uh, ABVI. But it is good for um, travel in brush. It can be used uh, directly in contact with the ground. Um, and so that would be a, a good tip for any off-road travel. And... Just one moment, I'm just trying to advance <laughs> the slide. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next slide, um, I'm just going to talk about eyeglasses. And so, um, eyeglasses is considered a secondary device. The cane or guide dog uh, would be a primary device because it provides path surface and object preview. So that's important for drop-offs um, and obstacles um, that are on the ground. Um, eyeglasses would be a secondary device because it would be, need to be used in conjunction with one of those primary devices. The eyeglasses only um, provides detection from um, your, for your head and upper body. So this would be good um, if you're walking down a sidewalk and there are low tree branches or anything that would be an obstacle for your head or upper body. So uh, how those work is I have a pair here and um, when you wear them, they will, um, they will vibrate. They have a detection range of 10 feet. It can't be, um, uh, you can't adjust that. It's just a standard setting, 10 feet. But they, they vibrate when something is within that 10 foot range with it um, in your head or upper body space. And the closer that you get to it, it, it the, the pulses will speed up until when you're within two feet of, of the obstacle, it will just be a continuous vibration. So uh, these would be really great if you're walking in open spaces. They're not good for use indoors because the 10 foot range will just cause them to vibrate constantly. So that can be really annoying. But they, the ones that we have here is, or these are the non-tinted. You can get them uh, with a sunglass tint as well. Okay. 
And on the slide we have uh, the Trekker Breeze. And so the Trekker Breeze is a GPS unit that is, uh, will provide you guidance as the crow flies, which is really great for a farm setting or any open area. Um, it also works on streets as well. So uh, it will give you guidance. It'll tell you, um, like on the, on the slide here, we have an example that it will say four-way intersection, Queens Boulevard crossing Askin Avenue. So it provides really great information if you are uh, riding the bus or riding in a vehicle or if you're walking, just walking and you want uh, intersection information as you go. Um, it works on college campuses really well where there's a lot of um, diagonal walkways and, and obviously no um, streets between buildings, but it will guide you from building to building. So I'm thinking in a farm setting that that could be very helpful. The only thing is, is this device I just found out recently is no longer available from, um, from its manufacturer, Humanware. But uh, there are some, because they still have some inventory, uh, because they still have um, some inventories with some companies that were selling them, you may still be able to find them online, um, which we did Google that and, and did find some examples also maybe on eBay if people are selling them. But uh, it's a really great tool if you don't have a smartphone. Um, on the next slide, um, um, if you have a smartphone, there are some apps that uh, are on are only for an iPhone at the moment. There's Blind Square, and that can provide um, uh, navigation in an open setting. So it would give you directional uh, information of uh, saying you're so many feet in a certain direction from where you want to go. So that that could be helpful. Um, it also provides uh, intersection information as you're walking down the road or traveling in a vehicle. So you can set up points of interest, you can uh, save favorites. Um, if you're using transportation, public transportation, you can uh, mark um, or save bus stops and then set an alert distance. So there's a lot of really uh, cool technology that is coming out for GPS. Uh, for Hopefully, I did hear Humanware like is working on something similar to the Trekker Breeze, so that'd be something to watch for if you don't have a smartphone, because it would be a standalone device. And so now I'm going to introduce James Hallahan, who works in our assistive technology department. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is James Hallahan, as Janie said. Uh, I'm the assistive technology uh, instructor here at EBI. Um, and I'm just going to go through a few of some of the basic things that I do some training on and show people. Um, I'm hoping it would be uh, solutions that would introduce, uh, intru interest some of the people that are uh, participating today. All right. All right. The first thing, uh, there's a new trend in technology, uh, both with assistive technology and with the regular consumer market, uh, to have wearable technology. Uh, you've probably heard of like smartwatches or the Apple Watch, um, and they even tried the Google Glass for a little bit. It was some fancy glasses with a camera on it, and it didn't really take off. Um, but meanwhile, uh, they've put together a couple different things for specifically for people uh, with low vision. One of them is the new the new eyes, uh, N U E Y E S. Uh, it uses military technology. Uh, there's a picture here on the slide of uh, what appears to be blacked out sunglasses. Uh, so sunglasses that are, the lenses have been replaced with uh, tiny screens, and there's a camera on the front. Uh, the military had used these originally to pilot drones. Uh, now, instead, they have attached a camera to the front instead of having it on the drone, and the person can see uh, what's in front of them uh, live through the camera. And while you're uh, maybe walking with some uh, practice coordination or watching a presentation or uh, being, uh, sitting at a meeting, uh, you can zoom in and out, uh, change different color contrasts, 
Um, and then they're going to be adding in new functionality with it as well uh, as time goes on uh, to be able to have uh, browsing email and the internet and also be able to use a technology called OCR, uh, which is looking at text and changing the text into speech. Another wearable technology uh, is called OrCam, uh, O-R-C-A-M. It's developed by a company in Israel. Uh, and fortunately, they're actually, similar to the new eyes, still developing it and continuing to develop it. The uh, first iteration was OK, um, but it's seen a lot of improvements lately. Um, it is a little strangely bulky. If you're uh, looking at the picture on the slide, there's a uh, small black box on top of the bigger one off to the left. It's a battery pack. It's about the size of a external hard drive. And it has some of the controls on it. You do need to carry it around in your pocket with a cord. Um, but fortunately, the camera is pretty small uh, and attaches to a regular, piece, uh, regular pair of glasses. And the device is generally used uh, for the technology I mentioned earlier, which is OCR. So the user uh, looks at a piece of paper or a sign uh, and points at it, and the camera recognizes that they're pointing and changes the text into speech and reads it on the go. Uh, initially, when it first came out, it was a little slow, um, and the sign, really being able to read signs was a little iffy. But now it can actually, even in the right lighting and the right setting, uh, read like the metal etched signs that you sometimes see at hotels or other places like that. Um, it also can recognize faces. However, of course, it doesn't know who all of your friends are. So you have to program all the faces ahead of time or as you go. Uh, and you put audio labels on it. Um, so you can actually also label uh, different items around your house. So uh, different size uh, saucepans or certain things in your kitchen. Uh, with your own customized labels, and it will recognize them. It recognizes them pretty quick, so if you're sitting at a meeting and you're looking around, it will tell you pretty quickly who's in the room if you've labeled them ahead of time. Uh, and in the future, they say they're going to implement different recognition, like recognizing uh, common signs, like stop signs, uh, and things like that. The Echo is an example of a consumer product. Uh, that is really making a lot of waves in the vision market. Uh, um, a lot of people use it at home, and I've actually got one here, and a lot of people uh, participating, I'm sure, have heard one or probably even own one. That's like the, the next big thing. Uh, this one here that's in the picture and also that I'm holding here, it's a tube about the size of, say, a Pringles can. And uh, it's the bigger model. There's also a smaller model called the Echo Dot. That's about the shape of a hockey puck. Um, the device itself is mostly, the larger one is mostly a speaker, and uh, it only has two buttons on the top and a dial for adjusting the volume. It has seven microphones on it uh, to be able to pick up voice from pretty far away. <clears throat> uh, and basically, the device functions on your Wi-Fi to, as a uh, reference or for, for listening to music, and it's an audio assistant. If you've used an iPhone before, or even an Android phone. Uh, you've probably used like Siri on the iPhone or uh, Google Now on the, on the Android phones. Um, and they're trying to, they've made it a dedicated device to use it. So you can use it to tell what to play music uh, or to look up information or tell you what the weather's like for the day. You can program it to have uh, routes and ask it what the traffic's like on the route. Um, you can also set it up with things, uh, different Wi Fi devices that you can buy. Separately. Uh, like smart plugs, and the way they work is you can uh, set it up so that you can ask it to turn on or off lights. Uh, you can buy specialized locks for it and ask it to lock doors or ask if the front door is locked. Um, uh, there's other things too that are coming out every day like ceiling fans and changing the uh, even thermostats. Um, it all operates on Wi-Fi, um, so if Wi-Fi is connected to anywhere on your property, you can uh, pretty much use your imagination to control all kinds of different things. Okay. Before I went too far, I wanted to also mention, um, speaking of consumer electronics, and Janie had mentioned uh, the iPhone before, I have here an iPad 
And if you used an iPhone or an iPad before, they come with built in with accessibility software on them. So that I've got I've got some software turned on in here that will actually it reads everything on the screen. Um, so and this comes on any iPad or iPhone, allowing you to anyone who even can't see the screen at all to uh, make phone calls, check their email, read their email, send email, uh, do weather, do a lot of the same functions that somebody using an iPad or an iPhone uh, can use. There are accessibility features on Android as well. Uh, they're not as easy to use as they are in iOS devices, though. All right. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Nikki, who's going to be coming back up to talk about uh, some different low-tech options. I'm back. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about vision rehabilitation therapy. Um, that is something that helps you perform your activities of daily living. And there are many high contrast or, or talking devices that you can use, ways to adapt some of the things you do. Usually, um, when you're adapting something, you're going to use color, texture, talking labels, or placement. So here we have some uh, pictures of various equipment. Um, there's a talking measuring tape, a talking scale, a talking measuring cup, a talking cooking thermometer. You can also get um, a talking thermometer to take your own temperature. There's a talking watch, and you can get them with just the time or with the date and time. Talking calculators. And uh, the thing that you see in the middle there where it's a pill bottle with a little yellow dot on it, that's called a pen front. It costs about $150. And what you do is you record your voice onto these little self adhesive labels. Then you put the label on the whatever you're marking, and then you use the pen front. And when your pen front touches the label, it will read back to you what it is. So it's a good way to mark a lot of different things that you might have similar. I mean, common use would be to mark your hand goods. Um, something else you might want to think of is uh, there's this peelable, flexible, insulating, not slip, durable liquid rubber that you can dip the handles of various tools in and they come out, it comes in 50 colors, so you could make them, you know, safety orange, safety yellow, whatever. You'd be able to discern them a little more easily, um, you know, on your tool bench, something like that. Ah, and load solutions. That is the, um, it shows you various marking tape. You see steps are marked there. Um, normally, I only mark the first and the last step. And I try to, if the tape's about two inches wide, put it an inch on the rise and an inch on the actual step so you can see it when you're ascending or descending. Sometimes with that diagonal stripe tape, if you put it on every step, it kind of creates an optical illusion and it kind of looks like a ramp, which would be very detrimental. Um, there's also some bright paints there. You can always use that kind of thing, various paint. Um, adding contrast is always good. Um, another way to add contrast is with tinted lenses. And sometimes different, different colors help you to do different things. Plum relaxes the eye muscle if you have a lot of eye fatigue. Yellow or orange glasses, lots of time. Enhance contrast enough that you can read things more e easily. Or where I've had some good luck with these um, are when people are mowing the lawn and they can't really see the path they just mowed. But with these orange or yellow tinted lenses, and they can fit right over your prescription lenses, um, they've been able to discern the path where they had just mowed. And so their, their lawn looks a little more smooth rather than kind of like a crazy quote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some other things, you want to always wear your protective lenses. 
Um, they can be just regular glasses, safety glasses. You can get, even if you don't have a prescription, you can get plain old lenses, blank glasses with safety glass to protect your eyes. Um, you just want to keep dirt, chemicals, anything out of your eyes, um, that sort of thing. You want to reduce the glare. And glossy things have a lot of glare. So maybe you want to use matte paper, not a real glossy paper. Um, you might want to put a foam visor right on your glasses to block out some of the glare. Or a baseball cap or some sort of a cap with a bill is always a good thing. It does two things. One, it keeps the sun out of your eyes. And two, it's kind of like an advanced warning, though only two to three inches, however, the, however large the brim on your hat is so that the hat will hit the tree branch before your face hits it. So that's always a good reason. Um, let me just see. Oh, we talked, you can use outside contrast, um, use a perimeter of colored stones or rocks, or I've seen people paint bowling balls, and then you can feel it and you can see it to keep you online. You can determine what color works best for you in each situation. I, use, I have a set of small um, pieces of wood, very thin, almost like a paint stirrer stick. And I have them in red and white and black and safety yellow, safety orange. That way I can put that little strip down wherever the person is looking for contrast and see which color they can see best in that situation with that kind of lighting. Um, you can always use magnifiers to increase the size, binoculars for seeing things in the distance. We also have monoculars, just one. You can wear it on a, a cord around your neck, pull it up when you need to see. Those people that have the reduced field, you can use your monocular backwards. And the items are smaller, but it gives you a bigger field of view, and that actually is helpful for some people. Um, there are also visual scanning skills that you can use. Um, scanning, tracking an object, that sort of thing. If you're ever out and you're trying to look for a street sign and you're trying to look for some kind of sign, if you're just looking around with your monocular, good luck. But if you scan the ground left to right, just kind of track it along and you find the pole, then lift your gaze up the pole to read the sign that works much better for you. Um, some other things you can do is use a bright light as a landmark or beacon. Uh, you can use brightly colored bicycle flags. We've posted those on some places. Um, another thing to do, uh, again, painting that line on the ground, that, that sort of thing. So I think that's about it. And now I'm going to turn this over to Joy F. She's going to talk to you about... Uh, yeah, career development. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you for sticking with us. My name is Joette Vahey, and I'm a career development specialist here. I'm going to put the slide to the... Oh, there. So I love my job because what I get to do is work with the specialists that you've heard a little bit from today and I partner with them to help people see the possibilities once they've learned those skills, once they've adjusted to their vision, once they've got the strategies, and they're ready to push forward and work out in the world. And uh, I often start that with the idea that I ask them, I, I ask them to think about what it is that they plan to do with their one wild and precious life, because they need to know what they want going forward. They need to know what they value, what their interests are, what people often have said to them about, you know, complimenting them and what they're good at doing, because they may not even recognize where their strengths are. So there's a lot of discovery work that has to get done at the very first uh, part of my uh, participating with their career development. So, and I work with people that are from 13 years old on up. There's no limit to how old the clients I work with uh, are, but it always starts with their figuring out what they know about themselves because studies show that if they pick a path that suits their values and meets their strengths, they're likely to stay in that job or 
excel in that job going forward. So the decision making has to be well founded in their in knowing themselves. Once they get a sense of that starting point, we go on to exploring options. And this is a place where some people get a little uncomfortable because they've often reached the place where they say, well, I want to work. I just don't know where I can work because I can't see. And my job, as exciting as it is, is to show them that there are lots of possibilities. They, what The biggest challenge is that they have to shape a mindset and they have to shape the mindset of the employers that are out there that it is possible. And they get to be the pioneers that show that whatever impact they're making paves the way a little easier for the people that are coming behind them. So we do some exploration. We talk about what what careers they might want to do. We do occupational research going online. We Google things. We go to the Department of Labor and we practice uh, researching industries and, and educational requirements and things at onetonline.org and lots and lots of other places. But they, these participants that are developing their career plans need to see what it is that that career option that they're pursuing might ask them for, for training, for ability, for personality style. Um, what are the trends? If they train now for a job that isn't going to exist in 10 years, then there's that not really a valid and realistic goal. So we talk about how to set those proper goals. And from there, we get focused on how to go about finding that job. So there's a lot of work that has to get done in teaching them how to reach out to employers, how to connect with other people, because they have friends, family, neighbors, former coworkers, church members, anybody that they're connected with in some way, shape, or form has other people that are their family, their friends, their neighbors, and so on. So we have to teach them how to, you know, revive a network so that they have access to opportunities. So we focus on getting them uh, connecting with people, and those people can then be helpful resources to teach them what they need to do going forward. And along with that comes a lot of career development work where they're revising the resume, they're practicing how to interview well, from the basics of what do you wear to interview, how do you answer questions about yourself or breaks in your employment, um, how if you've been fired, how do you handle those kinds of conversations. So there's a lot of strategies that we spend time on to help them put their best impression forward to put, really make the good impact that they need to market their skills and abilities. And then, of course, there's the job searching. They, they have to then, once they've got all, all of that pulled together, they have to take some kind of action, which is towards finding a job that meets all those values that they learned way back at the beginning of the process. So we learn about um, websites to go to. Uh, LinkedIn is a social media forum for a lot of um, uh, professional opportunities, and it just it, little by little by little, they learn how to cast a wide net to, to you know, find the job that they're most interested in. Uh, and along the way, we also learn about how to draft those cover letters and write those thank you letters that is such a protocol for 2017. It's, it's really hard work to find work, and, and throughout this career development process, uh, the participants learn exactly what's taken what's involved in it. And my last slide here, promise it's here. Oh, there. Okay. So the most important thing about my job as a career development specialist is that I get to help people see that there are possibilities. So I help them change their mindsets to show that they don't have to think, well, what are the blind jobs out there? There are jobs for people who may be blind, who may be visually impaired, but they're no different from the jobs that somebody fully sighted would have. And um, part of the challenge is to help them see that if they can discuss and disclose their disability with confidence and with uh, an emphasis on their uh, their accomplishments and their skills and their solid good traits, um, and they can advocate for themselves. The world is their oyster, and that's essentially 
their ability to explore those possibilities. That's what it's all about. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to send, bring you to the next slide. And what you see on the screen is our contact information, Nikki, Danny, James, myself, and Joe Beth. I think we all, I can speak for everybody. We thank you very much for participating. Maybe there are some questions that we would like to address. I'm going to pass it off to Joe Beth. Thank you very much. Paul, we're going to turn back to you for questions. Thank you very much to everybody at uh, Goodwill of the Finger Lakes for that excellent information that you shared with us today. Again, if you have questions, we ask that you would go ahead and enter those into the chat window. Make sure you send, uh, click the send button and send that to all panelists. Also, if you have a question you'd like to ask verbally, you should see a little hand icon next to your name. And if you click on that, we will plan to activate your microphone. While we're doing that and getting ready for our questions, we do have four quick poll questions for you. And the first one simply asks about your affiliation. If you could tell us what kind of organization you're from. You may be uh, involved in multiple organizations, but if you'd pick the best one for us, out of those choices, we'd appreciate it. Is that another question come in? Okay. Okay. I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds on that. My automatic timer is not allowing me to end it quite yet, so you've got nine seconds, and then we'll go to the next question. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to save those results. And open our next poll question that asks about the information that was presented today. Could you please let us know if it I met your expectations and the choices. Again, you need to click the radio button and also uh, make sure you submit your poll results. I'm going to forward that to you. more seconds on that. Okay. All right. And then we'll save those results. Next question asks about the technology that was used today. Did you find it effective and usable? If you could let us know, please. One more seconds on that. And save the question, save the results. All 
Our final poll question. Based on today's session, would you attend another session in the series? Can you let us know on that? We have several poll questions, or excuse me, several uh, questions about the presentation. So make sure you stick around. We've got some, I think, some more helpful information for you. And just a few more seconds on that poll. I will close that, and we'll go on to our question and answer period. Okay. Looks like people got along pretty well with the technology. All right. At this point, we we'll turn things over to Sean Ehlers, who's assisting us with our uh, technical technical aspects today, and he will be putting the um, questions on the screen for the staff at Goodwill of the Finger Lakes to respond to, and I'll turn it over to them. All right, so it looks like our first question is, can you clarify what the different colors of canes excuse me, signify? And I'm going to turn this question over to Janie today. Um, so uh, a cane that is white with a red tip is a universal symbol for uh, legal blindness. And uh, however, you can get a cane in a different color from Ambutech if you aren't comfortable with a cane that is white with a red tip uh, for identification. So that is something to keep in mind. The only thing is, is every state has um, different, has white cane laws. They're all a little bit different, so you want to check what it is in your state, but um, it does help to protect you as a pedestrian when you cross streets, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but yes, a, a, a cane that is white with a red tip, and actually I have two examples here. I don't think I... This is this cane is an ID cane. It's a little bit thinner, um, and it's it's meant for indoor use. And uh, for, uh, this this cane here is um, the white cane or long cane with the uh, rubber grip. It's meant for uh, longer use, indoors and outdoors. Um, both can be folded, but that is something to keep in mind too. You do there are. Um, there are different types of white canes as well as different colors. Great. Question two is that, would the user need to pre-program their farm buildings for guidance with the GPS direction units or smartphone? Janie, do you want to do this one too? Sure. <laughs> Um, yes, you would. Uh, with the Trekker Brief, you can actually save that as a place of importance, and then um, then it, it will guide you as the crow flies back to that location from wherever you are. Um, so that that is really the Trekker Brief. Uh, the, the there is also on the Blind Square GPS app, smartphone app that is thirty nine ninety nine. It's only available on an iPhone. Um, you can download that from the iTunes store. That has a tracking function. So it will, once you save the place as a place of importance, then it will guide you just by distance and direction. So you can tell it you want clock face directions, you want compass directions, you want it, uh, the information in feet, meters, um, there's a couple different choices for that, so you can make those selections in the settings and then have it guide you in that way. It's, it's def it definitely doesn't work as well as, as Checker Brief, but it's, it would be uh, an alternative. Uh, question three, what would you suggest for an individual with pinpoint vision in one eye only? Uh, it's a pretty general question, but I remember this question popping up when I was talking about the different kinds of glasses, so I'm assuming it's kind of where they're going with that question. 
Um, the glasses, I guess I've never, the glasses are pretty new. The, uh, the new eyes and the different wearable technology, they have the camera and the screens. And I don't have any experience with somebody uh, with only sight in one eye, or I guess particularly narrow sight in one eye. Um, but it is designed to maximize the sight you have. Um, and uh, I'm always surprised to see what people do when they have the technology, with the technology, once they have it in their hands. Um, I can't imagine that there'd be, I think it would be something that they'd have to try themselves. Um, and I think you'd, they'd be surprised at how well it works. Can I add something to that? Sure. Um, I'd just like to add one thing to that. Um, with any of the glasses, uh, you can have various, you know, strengths of magnification. What you really want to do is have the least amount of magnification so that you can see. And if you have that tunnel vision, that pinpoint vision, if it's if you magnify it too many times, it doesn't fit in your field of view. So lots of times people with the tunnel vision, they're only going to magnify it two times, three times, so they can keep it in their field of view. So that's just something to think about. Higher power isn't always the best for everyone. Uh, also, the uh, uh, gla standard glasses are going to be a lot cheaper than the new eyes. New eyes is currently about six thousand um, dollars. Are there similar products to the Amazon Echo specifically for an iPhone? Um, so there's two parts to the question. The first part: Are there similar products? To the Amazon Echo, yes. Uh, Google has also made their own. Uh, the idea of having a smart speaker uh, is now Amazon started a trend that everybody's going to be copying for a while. Uh, Google made one called the Google Home. It's a tiny bit cheaper. The Echo is uh, $180, and then the uh, one that's the size of the hockey puck, the Dot, is $50. The uh, Google Home is, I think, right in the middle, like 120, 130, and does basically all the same things as the Amazon Echo, except, of course, you can't sync it with your uh, Amazon accounts as well, or maybe at all. I'm not, not completely sure. The Google one, of course, has the connection to Google search results. So if you ask the general questions, it would be uh, more, it's generally more accurate. And it is a little bit cheaper, which is kind of cool. I've met some people who really like the Google Home, and but I guess the Echo is since it was first, you always have the people who like sort of a, a soft spot for that. Apple is also making one that's really expensive. It's like seven hundred dollars, um, and it's supposed to be basically uh, less "quote unquote" intelligent, but a better quality speaker. Um, so I don't, and I don't think it's out yet. They did a, some recent announcement. So that'll be interesting to see what they do with that, too. Uh, the part about being specifically for an iPhone, fortunately, the Echo and the Google Home uh, do work with iPhone and Android, as far as I know, equally well. They both, you have a companion app that goes with them. Um, but if you had, for example, um, an aging family member or somebody who doesn't like technology, um, you could set up the Echo for them. It has to be set up with a computer or a phone initially, but then you can you don't have to keep coming back to the phone for it. You get more usability with the phone, but you don't need the phone to check the weather. You don't actually need the phone for any of the basic functions ever again, for the most part. Just Wi-Fi. Yes, just Wi-Fi, exactly. Any comments on the utility of glasses for colorblind? Uh, I I don't really know of anything to help with color vision. Um, if you are wearing sunglasses, sometimes uh, the amber glasses, all those change color. If you want to get the truest color rendition with a tinted lens, is to go with the gray or somebody. Sometimes they call blue blockers, but the gray lenses, and you can get them in various transmissions. Uh, strengths, so they're very light or very dark. They give the truest color rendition. All the other ones are going to uh, turn your colors a little, little bit off. Oh, 
And we, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there are color identifiers. It's a device you can purchase or an app on your phone, and you can just turn your phone towards it like you're taking a picture or use the device, and uh, it will tell you the color that it is. And I've used that with people who have different colored tags on items, and they're trying to find all the blue tagged items, and that works real well for that sort of thing. It's possible to re, uh, read the question again. I'm not sure if the question is about, there was a trend going around of video trending on Facebook where there were glasses you put on that seemed to cure colorblindness. I'm assuming people oh, here have to use them. Yes. So, it's, yeah, I guess it's- They're too new for us to know too much. Yeah, I guess they have to see. I'm not sure if that's where the question was going. I wasn't sure if maybe anybody had tried those. Oh, I, there's uh, somebody commented and said they're called Enchroma glasses. So hopefully something we can try. Yeah, just saw those in Facebook. Do you have recommendations for portable electronic magnifiers that farmers can take on the job with them to read pesticide instructions, et cetera? Uh, yes, there's an almost infinite number of different kinds of CCTVs or electronic magnifiers. Um, Portable and bigger, or everything from the size of a average, your average smartphone all the way up to gigantic with 24-inch uh, screens and bigger. For portable ones, uh, I guess there's two kind of ways to approach the question. Thinking of uh, there's a, lot, a number of companies uh, such as Freedom Scientific, Enhanced Vision, and uh, there was another one that was called Optelec that make a lot of really good handheld magnifiers. They are kind of expensive. Um, there's another company called Zoom Max. It's all one word, uh, Z-O-O-M-M-A-X. And they have a line of CCTVs, handheld electronic magnifiers that are, the, their models are called Snows, so like the Snow 7, et cetera. And there's, they can be significantly cheaper than the mainstream one. The, uh, Picture quality on the screen isn't quite as good, but especially if you're just reading pesticide instructions and you just need to read basic text, you're not uh, reading a book for several hours or anything like that, it might be uh, might be the best for you. If you go on a lot of these companies' websites, they have uh, local dealers who also can be available to come to your house and show you different kinds. So you can take them out and try, the, try reading them to check it out. Um, there are also a few on Amazon that are very small and very cheap from companies in China. We have one here, and you really have to put it right onto the paper to be able to read it. If you take it away, the focal length of the camera doesn't focus for about three or four inches. Um, but again, if it's reading basic, maybe basic stuff, uh, it'd be maybe something to check out. And those can be only about $130. Handheld magnifiers uh, in the size of maybe four inches to seven inches are going to be in the range of the, your Chinese $120 ones all the way up to the mainstream ones that are about $800. How much do the eyeglasses cost generally? Okay. The eyeglasses are, are very reasonable. You can get them for um, $99 through the Ambutech website. So you can get them um, in clear or uh, a sunglass tint. There is another device that I forgot to mention, the Mini Guide. Um, the Mini Guide is available um, through APH, um, the American Printing House for the Blind. That is more expensive, but it's handheld. Um, it works much the same way with vibration, but also it has auditory feedback too. Um, it's five. Um, Five hundred and forty-five dollars. So the eyeglasses are really um, uh, much more uh, uh, economically um, cost cost effective, but um, but also something real simple to keep in mind too uh, for upper body detection is uh, just the upper protective technique that you can use. You just cross your um, cross your body, hold your hand with your palm out. Um, in front of you, so you're giving yourself some um, time to react. Whatever would contact you, would contact your hand first, and then give you time to slow down and avoid um, your upper body or your body bumping into obstacles. So that's that's something that you can do. Also, just 
Wearing a, um, a wide brim hat can help protect you or give you a little warning before you bump into something like branches. Um, and always just covering your, um, your eyes too um, with sunglasses, whatever, like what um, Nikki was talking about, different colors, just anything to protect, give you a little warning. So um, those would be um, even cheaper than, than doing eyeglasses, but you're not getting that uh, 10 foot detection. Eyeglasses. All right, I'm working with a client that has a complaint of being unable to clip their own toenails due to low vision. <clears throat> Any suggestions on help? The client also has arthritis in her hands. Um, well, we uh, had talked about the digital magnifiers a little bit. Um, I worked with somebody who had uh, diabetes and the symptoms showed on their feet. And they were able to use a desktop digital magnifier to you, you it's a, basically a monitor with a camera overhanging in front of the monitor and you can place it on a table and you'll be able to observe your feet if that's helpful um i guess i'm not sure about the clipping part if arthritis was the obstacle yeah <clears throat> i think with arthritis with this situation someone is having difficulty uh, clipping their toenails and the issue is arthritis. Um, you can go through medical supply catalogs and get some clippers that would be built up a little bit so you don't have to make that really, you know, close pincer grasp type of thing. You can do it a little bit more like that. You can feel and get the clipper under the nail, that sort of thing. And if someone has diabetes or anything like that, they should be going to a podiatrist anyways to have their feet checked, and quite often they will take care of that. Or there's always, you know, go for a pedicure. <laughs> Thanks very much again to the team from uh, Google of Finger Lakes for that uh, information and response to those questions. Um, we'll let you know that our next webinar in this series is scheduled tentatively for July 18th. We'll be talking about independent living centers. Um, the group from April, which is the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living, will be giving a presentation about services that are provided at centers for independent living all across the country and how agribility and centers for independent living can work together. So if you have any uh, interest or um, activity with either agribility or people with disabilities, it will be, a, uh, I'm sure, a useful session for you. Well, again, we will be uh, archiving the recording of this session within the next few days, so uh, if you'd like to review it or had any difficulties today, uh, we will let you know since you're on the registration list. So um, at this point, I will wish you a good afternoon and hope to see you again in this series. <laughs>